When the well's dry, we know the worth of water. Benjamin Franklin, Paul Richard's Almanac, 1746. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And there's a voice that runs through many cultures. And while it isn't always a loud voice, it is a persistent voice. It is a voice of warning. It prods us to remember to take care of where we live. The resources that make up our existence can be squandered. And many people believe that we are in fact squandering the essential resources to our existence, the air, the water, the earth itself, and that we're leaving a decimated planet for our children to inherit. Others say, well, yes, the climate is weird and the environment is suffering, but we can create a new technology that will right the wrongs of the past and create the earth whole again. Well, maybe that's true, maybe. But we do have to confront the fact that the climate is changing and we have to begin to understand why it's changing, how it's changing, and what we can do about it. And this is really not just a problem here in the United States. It's a global problem. And what makes it even more challenging is different parts of the world will experience climate change differently. Even parts in the U.S., different parts of the country will experience it quite differently than others. Those species that can figure out a way to adapt are those species that will survive. So why don't you join us as we take a look at climate change from a very local perspective. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to confront only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. Learn what it had to teach. Learn what it had to teach. Of all the communities across this great land, that can tell America's story, particularly its early story, there's no one place better than Concord, Massachusetts. So it's quite fitting we come to Concord to talk about climate change. And as we stand here by the beautiful Concord River, just uh, below North Bridge, the historic North Bridge, um, we want to talk about climate change. And you say, well, why Concord? Well, they had an interesting individual who lived here, Henry David Thoreau. And we think of Henry David Thoreau more as a philosopher and a writer. Civil disobedience comes to mind. However, he was a true citizen scientist. And he would walk through his beloved Concord and he would write down what he saw when the marsh marigold bloomed, when the apple trees bloomed, when ice was off Walden Pond. Take all these notes in great quantity and in great detail. And so we have this excellent picture of what Concord looked like in the late 1840s and the early 1850s. Now that data is very useful to us here today in the 21st century because we have an excellent picture of the way the landscape was. To understand why it's so important and how it can be used, we're going to catch up with Dr. Richard Premack of Boston University, a professor of biology there who's written a new book called Walden Warming, Climate Change Comes to Thoreau's Woods. Dr. Premack, we all know Henry David Thoreau as a writer and a philosopher, but in following his footsteps through Concord, did you learn anything about the man that surprised you? I, I think what surprised me was how often he was outside, the fact that he was actually went for a walk around Concord um, every day for four hours a day and then kept his notes about what he saw. So I think that he was really quite remarkable in terms of his um, level of detail of observations and uh, his just his observation ability. They were really quite extraordinary. I mean, I knew that he wrote a lot, that he kept journals, that he wrote over two million words, that he wrote many books, but I just didn't appreciate his just incredible ability to make day-to-day -day observations um, uh, in such a consistent way. That was really quite extraordinary. This exploration of Thoreau's work turned into a personal journey for you. How did you stumble across Thoreau's work as a scientist? Well, in, in starting in 2003, we began looking for any old records of when plants were flowering, um, in the Massachusetts area when birds were arriving in the spring, uh, when insects were flying. So we really were on a quest to just find any evidence of, 
of when things happened in the past and then to be able to compare them with when things happen in the present. And after several months of searching, um, a friend of mine, Phil Cafaro from Colorado State University, um, asked me if, you know, why didn't we check on Thoreau's records? And, you know, we had never heard of Thoreau's records of flowering time. Uh, these records are very well known to Thoreau scholars, but they're not well known to modern ecologists, people who are working in the present time. And so when we got a copy of these records from an independent Thoreau scholar named Brad Dean, we were just amazed uh, by the level of detail of these tables that Thoreau had made up um, toward the end of his life. What he'd done was he'd gone through his journals and extracted all the dates on when he first saw plants in flower from 1851 to 1858. And just the level of detail was so astonishing. There were hundreds of plant species for which uh, for those eight years he'd recorded the first flowering dates. And as soon as we saw these, we knew that these were just going to be fabulous, that these were just going to be the key to understanding the effects of climate change um, in the eastern United States. We actually subsequently found out that he'd also made up tables for leafing out times of woody plants and also for bird arrival times in the spring. So this just became uh, an unbelievable set of data to work with. We've actually found a lot of other records from uh, eastern Massachusetts, from places like Mount Auburn Cemetery and the Manomet Center for Conservation Science. But of all the records we found, that these records of Thoreau's that we found in um, kind of 2003 and subsequent years were really extraordinary and as far as we know that these records kept by Thoreau are the most detailed oldest records of anywhere in the United States or even North America. Climate change has certainly been ratcheted up in the news this year. What has Thoreau's work revealed to you about our changing climate? Well I think that what Thoreau's records teach us most fundamentally is that climate change isn't something which is happening in the future. So climate change isn't something which is going to be affecting our children or our grandchildren, it's actually happening now. So the warming temperatures are already affecting the flowering times of the trees, of, of the wildflowers, the leafing out times of the trees. It's affecting, to a lesser extent, the arrival time of the birds. It's affecting the flight time of insects. And it's also affecting the distribution of species. So it's affecting certainly the distribution of birds and butterflies. And it's also affecting the abundance of plant species. So it's already creating winners and losers. So species which can adapt to these warming conditions are increasing in abundance and species which are not adapting to these warming conditions are declining in abundance. So it's already happening now. It's happening here in Concord and it's happening elsewhere in the eastern United States. There seems to be serious repercussions when flowers bloom early and nature seems to be totally out of sync. But just what are those repercussions? Well, what we think might be happening is that um, species react in different ways to these warming conditions. So one is just the physiological response. So as conditions get warmer, it's just too hot for a lot of species and they really can't respond rapidly, they can't evolve enough, and they also can't disperse fast enough to keep track with this changing climate. So a lot of species, particularly rare species, species of very limited distribution, and species which um, don't have good dispersal ability, so they don't have, say, seeds that can really uh, go a long distance, or if there's, say, some spider living in the ground or salamander, they can't really migrate fast enough to really track the changing climate, and they're just going to die. So that's kind of one example of, of species, some species being unable to kind of change with the environment. But what we also expect is that ecological relationships are going to change with this warming climate, that particularly plants will be able to flower and leaf out earlier um, with a warming climate, but birds don't seem to be as responsive to temperature. So what, what might be happening is that uh, a lot of the uh, bird species which are not going to respond to climate change, particularly bird species which are coming from South America or Central America, like a lot of the warbler species, for example, uh, what's going to happen with them is that they're going to arrive a little bit too late to catch the big pulse of insects which are emerging in the spring and then are feeding on the plants. And a lot of these birds might starve to death or might not have enough food to uh, feed their nestlings, and therefore these birds might be declining in abundance. And similarly in the autumn, when these birds start migrating, a lot of these birds are migrating um, earlier than they did in the past because the conditions get warmer and they might not have enough fruit to eat. Uh, a lot of the fruits might be maturing at the same time and the birds might not have enough food to eat and therefore be very hungry or starve to death on their migration south. This is just something that you know, we're really learning a lot about. These ecological questions 
are something that we speculate a lot about, but we really don't have strong evidence uh, for these types of, of ecological problems, which ecologists sometimes call mismatches. One thing which Thoreau teaches us, and the many other naturalists that we have in Massachusetts are, are teaching us, is that keeping diaries is extremely important for tracking the effects of climate change, and that these types of diaries are extremely useful. So I would urge um, high school students or uh, people of, of any, in edu any educational situation, or people who are just interested in nature, so just homeowners or people who are interested in uh, looking at the effects of a changing climate, to just start keeping a diary of when you see things happening um, during the year. So for example, if you um, live near a pond, record when the ice melts on the pond or when it freezes uh, in the autumn. If you are uh, interested in birds, record when you first start seeing certain species of birds on your bird feeder or, or in your yard. Or if you're interested, if you have a garden, record when the apple trees flower, when the, the peach trees start flowering, the blueberry bushes start flowering. So if people start recording this kind of information and do it consistently from year to year, then you can really build up a wonderful set of observations which will not only enrich your life, which will not only give you a lot of pleasure, but will also be very useful for scientists potentially at some point in the future. One of the things in your book that caught my attention was your discussion about invasive species and their ability to adapt to a changing climate. Why is that? So there's a lot of reasons why invasive species are successful. So one of them is that they're, they're often better able to take advantage of disturbed conditions. So these are species which are from, often from Europe or Asia. And in those habit places where there's been a long history of human impact at a very high level, these species have really been selected for their ability to tolerate high levels of disturbance. So these species are often very successful at living in very disturbed conditions also in the United States. Uh, many of these species are also adapted to living in places where there's high levels of nitrogen in the soil. And again, that's characteristic of a lot of uh, these wetlands where purple loosestrife, for example, is growing. Also, one thing which is called the predator release hypothesis is that, um, that these species are controlled by specialized insects and fungi and bacteria um, and by grazing animals like birds and mammals in their native habitat. And in the United States, they don't have these same types of specialized um, animals or fungi or bacteria or insects which are, which, are, which are attacking them in the United States and therefore they're able to just grow very luxuriously because nothing is eating them or nothing is growing on their leaves. So that's kind of one theory. But what we've also seen um, in our research in Concord is that these invasive species are extremely flexible in terms of their leafing out time in the spring and also their flowering time. So these species are very responsive to climatic variation and particularly when we have these extraordinarily warm years associated with climate change, these species are able to start flowering really early, uh, leafing out really early, and this gives them a competitive advantage on a lot of the native species which tend to be a little bit more conservative and don't really respond as, as rapidly to these, this climatic variation. You know, it's not hard to understand why our early colonists who came here in the early 1800s and brought the purple loosestrife with them, why they brought it. It is indeed a very pretty flowering plant that adds great color to here in mid-August to this landscape, this water, very watery landscape. We're here in Rice City Pond, a part of the Blackstone River Canal Heritage State Park, and we've come out here to take a look at the the purple loosestrife, kind of follow up on Dr. Pemac's observations and experiences with this invasive species. It's one of those plants that uh, is not nat native to the United States or Canada, to North America. It came here as part of uh, uh, plantings by colonists who wanted to reproduce the beauty of their homeland. It also came here in a ballast of uh, sailing vessels used as uh, soil and rocks were used as ballast and when they had enough cargo where they would dump out the excess ballast and voila, accidentally, we had invasive species and that's where a lot of species come from, from ships' holes. And as we come up here to this beautiful stand here, we get a chance to look at it and get a sense to appreciate its beauty, but also get the chance to understand it is a bad actor in the environment. It crowds out other native species, it, has, it colonizes quickly, thick root ball, 
annually each of these plants can produce two million seeds. So it reproduces quite rapidly and quite well. The challenge is that it's got no value nutrient to any of the species that live around here in this pond. Um, it has a real impact on choking out the native species on our very biologically diverse wetlands. It's really a bad actor and it's hard to control. It doesn't have any natural predators. As you look at it here, you get a good sense to see just how infestated it is here. The challenge here and the frustrating aspect is that this type of species appears to be the one that can withstand a changing climate. It has already demonstrated, it has adapted well to different climates over thousands of miles. It has already demonstrated it has adapted different habitats from wet, moist areas like we have here to uh, open spaces, to disturbed places in, in, in cities. You'll see some purple loosestrife around uh, vacant city lots. So it seems to do quite well at reproducing itself very quickly. And that is the real challenge for species here dealing with a changing climate. Not everyone can adapt quickly. And it's that speed that is necessary because the scientists are amazed just how quickly the polar ice caps are melting and how quickly the temperatures are heating up. A degree, two or three at most, and you will see drastic changes in our landscape here. So the climate of, of New England has been very variable. The climate of North America has been ex extremely variable. Um, actually during uh, Thoreau's time in, in the 1840s and 1850s, it was actually an extraordinarily cold time, which is what people call the Little Ice Age. And, and we were kind of coming out of the Little Ice Age at the end of Thoreau's life. So the climate tends to be extremely variable in general, but particularly in New England. So in New England, we have uh, both great climatic variation caused by where we are in terms of weather systems, but also great climatic variation because of our topography in New England, where we have coasts and islands and mountains all in a very small area. Um, but the climate change which we're experiencing now is due really to human impact. So in urban areas like Boston, it's in part due to urbanization, what scientists call the urban heat island effect, but it's also due to this global phenomenon uh, caused by the production of greenhouse gases through the burning of fossil fuels like oil, coal, natural gas, and also through the cutting down of tropical rainforests. And this human-created climate change, which we are presently in right now, is happening so fast that the plants and animals really are probably not going to be able to respond to it, either but through evolutionary changes or through changes in their distribution. And so this change which is occurring is just extraordinarily rapid at the moment, and it's something which plants and animals really haven't experienced before. Uh, but of all the places in the United States, I mean, Concord is probably the best suited to deal with climate change because it's a, it's a place which already has a lot of water, um, and the people here are relatively well off, so they have a lot of personal resources to be able to deal with the effects of climate change in Concord. But a lot of areas of the United States are really not so suited to deal with the effects of climate change. So we think a lot of areas of the western United States, particularly southern California or um, Arizona and New Mexico. So those areas are already uh, experiencing very high temperatures. Uh, they're already under severe uh, limitations because of, of lack of water. And if the conditions get just a little bit warmer, those places are going to have less water resources to draw on from the Rockies, but also the, the, those environments are going to evaporate more water because of the higher temperatures. And so those areas of the American Southwest are going to be potentially devastated um, by climate change and, and the severe droughts that it's going to create. A lot of farmers in the American Midwest, particularly in the southern Midwest, um, those areas are already um, at the limits of agriculture already. And if conditions get just a couple of degrees warmer, we might have agriculture failing in a lot of areas of the United States. Um, in cities like Boston, or in places like Massachusetts or the eastern United States, um, the places which are really most vulnerable to the effects of climate change are really low-lying coastal areas. Um, and we experienced that when New York City was hit by Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, not only had devastation in the coastal areas of New Jersey, but large areas of Manhattan were flooded and the subway system was devastated and cost billions of dollars to repair. And these kinds of, of large storms hitting low-lying areas are going to become more severe in coming decades, both because the storms are going to become more severe and also because of 
uh, warming temperatures, the polar ice caps are melting, glaciers are melting, and this is causing sea level to rise. And so this combination of stronger storms with higher sea levels is potentially uh, catastrophic for large numbers of cities um, in the eastern United States. And people in Boston feel somehow secure. We feel that, that we're, you know, we're relatively protected. But actually, Boston is so vulnerable to the effects of rising sea levels and storms. If Hurricane Sandy had just veered slightly north and it hit Boston, that much of the metropolitan Boston area would have been underwater. So large areas of Boston, uh, Cambridge, and Medford would have been underwater and would have cost the same tens of billions of dollars that New York experienced, we would have experienced in Boston. So we would, we would just lucked out because we came within inches of, of having our, our major dams overtopped by storm surges. Now take a good look. This is what a vernal pool looks like when it's all dried up. Completely dry. Now, mid-April, May, this was probably about four and a half, five feet deep of water here. And this is where a lot of critters came to um, uh, reproduce. Our salamanders and wood frogs and a whole number of folks like that who use the vernal pools as a, a key way of keeping their species alive. Now the thing about climate change is it's very unpredictable. And that unpredictability really impacts animals, amphibians, and birds much more than it does us, um, at least at the present time, unless you live in places like California, which is going through tremendous drought at this time frame. And so what we're worried about is these fragile environments, which is so critical to the reproduction of these important species. So we're going to catch up with naturalist and interpreter for the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation, Catherine Parrott, who's going to talk about this fragile environment, little critters who uh, make this a part of their, uh, their lifespan, and learn a, bit, a little bit more about how climate change impacts these very significant habitats. Okay, let's take a look at this wet area. Last time I was here, we saw a pair of wood ducks, which means there's plenty for them to eat. If you look along at the area here, there's plenty of sticks that have fallen, lots of mossy areas for salamanders and frogs to hide. And as I'm looking in, we're looking for salamander eggs, so we want to look for sticks that have submerged where the salamander attaches the egg mass to the stick. And I'm seeing some right over here, and all along this submerged stick, I'm seeing cloudy white masses of what I believe is spotted salamander eggs. But what happens here in the spring is a lot of breeding is going on. The salamanders and wood frogs will uh, spend the rest of their lives in the woods. As you can see all through here, there's plenty of leaf litter, um, plenty of uh, rocks and logs for them to hide in during the summer months. But in the spring, they have an important job to do. They need to find a wet place to lay their eggs. So this pool that fills from the winter snows melting or spring rains fills up here and provides a perfect habitat for wood frogs and salamanders. We don't have an inlet for this water or an outlet. It kind of just evaporates um, and get soaked up through the, the roots of the plants here over time. So there's no chance for fish to come in through here. As no fish, which are the biggest predators of egg masses that we're looking for today. So it's a nice safe place. A, a nursery for salamanders and frogs. Well, the spring pool is already a very delicate, sensitive area. It depends on a lot of variables for the salamanders and frogs to survive. Uh, we have to think about how much snow was here in the winter, the temperature of the days in the spring, how quickly the water is going to evaporate. Um, and all of this is intensified with climate change or extreme temperatures or heavy rainfalls or even longer dry periods. So all the delicateness, all the sensitivities in the vernal pool are just uh, worsened and the, the threat is greater with um, climate change. It's a race to finish their metamorphosis before they go back to the forest. 
It is a very delicate balance, and that has been the way for ages with ver vernal pools. But we just are concerned that things are going to be more intense and uh, more, make it more difficult for the um, salamanders and frogs to survive. Well, I think Thoreau's message is very clear if you read Walden. I mean, it was very clear what he thought was important for people to do. So he, first of all, you know, emphasized that you really need to change yourself. So his message in Walden was to live simply. And one of the things that we really need to do to deal with the effects of climate change is starting with ourselves, we need to produce less greenhouse gases, we need to use less material resources, and we can do that by having smaller cars, living in smaller houses, turning down our thermostats um, in the wintertime, using less air conditioning, uh, driving our cars less, using more public transportation, eating more simply. But Thoreau also, even though he was naturally kind of a cantankerous individual and was not that social, he recognized that to really change the world, you need to be involved, in, you need to be engaged in society. So in his case, the great issues of his time were stopping wars, stopping unjust wars, and also abolishing slavery. And these, this is what he was engaged in. He wrote speeches, he gave public lectures, he wrote letters, he talked to everyone around him. He tried to change people both in Concord, in Massachusetts, and even across the United States. And the same thing today, if you want to deal with climate change, you have to start with yourself, but eventually you really have to engage with society. And one of the things that struck me a great deal about the interview with Dr. Primack was very simply how much time Henry David Thoreau spent outside and what he noticed, what he observed, and how he took that information and that knowledge and we are using it today as we understand our changing climate. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Army of the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. You know, scientists rarely agree on anything, and yet 95% of all the scientists in the world agree that climate change is happening and it is real. There's an interesting guy who wrote a book called Cooling the Planet, and he asks a very simple question. He says, are humans smarter than a frog? And he paints this picture, we put a frog in a, a, a pot of water nice and cool, and he's enjoying himself, and we very slowly turn up the heat. And he's enjoying himself, we turn up the heat a little more, and slowly, slowly, he never sees it coming. He's cooked. Are we smarter than the frog? We see climate change is coming, are we gonna be cooked? And you probably say, well, what can I do? I'm just, you know, I can't control government policy. Well, you know what, there's a lot you can do. As a family, as individuals, Go out into your backyard, go out into the woods, go out into the world, and write down what you see. Be a citizen scientist. Read. Write stuff down. Get a rain gauge. How much rain is in your backyard? We all can conserve water. That's an easy thing. But by sharing information that you find in your own little world with other people who are doing this exact same thing, you can really begin to make a difference. Thoreau certainly did. And did he know that his data in 18, late 1840s, early 1850s would be so useful to us today as we try to understand the changing world we live in? Of course he didn't. But he had a vision. He said, this is important. I need to know what my world is like. So. Become a citizen scientist, and hopefully, I'll see you along the Blackstone. Yeah.